Here we talk about managing growth, essentially looking at the entrepreneurial process to sort of summarize what one gets from doing the entrepreneurial process, some of the advantages and the risks, and then talk about the issues that you face as you move out of the startup phase and into the larger operational phase. To summarize how we got here, start a business, you identify an opportunity, you envision, envision a business, business model around the opportunity, bring the resources and the team together that are needed to be successful at the business, and then you run and grow that business going forward. Run it and grow it from a startup to an ongoing, going concern business, if you will. This is worth it to many people because you get to realize your vision. You also get to build something that lasts and potentially will outlast you for many decades or even centuries if you're lucky and leave a legacy. You get to run your own show, be in control at least in terms of the how the business develops and evolves over time. You get cash flow immediately, you get a job out of it, perhaps a very good job where a lot of cash flow comes out of it and protects. Perhaps you could even build something that is an asset that can support your family and yourself and maybe multiple generations going forward, and from that one gets a sense of accomplishment. That is, of course, when everything works and everything works well. There are also some risks. Could be that you have a great, you think is a great idea, but you're wrong and it's, there's no market, the customers don't show up, or maybe they show up, but they're just not willing to pay enough for you to get your business up and rolling. You can sell something, but it costs you more to make it or more to deliver it at the quality that people want than you could ever really get out of the marketplace. You might get it going and maybe even be struggling, but then a competitor comes in with more assets, more resources, more economies of scale, and basically takes you out of the marketplace. Essentially, lets you do all the hard work of building the business and creating the idea and then taking all the value away. You may not have enough resources to sustain yourself. You may have the wrong team. You may not have some critical person. Um, you may not have someone that can sell. You may have the greatest product in the world, but everything has to be sold and no one knows how to sell. Or you might have the greatest uh, idea of what the market is, but you just can't make it. You don't have the technology skills on board to make the product and make it successful. Or you might not have good support or good advice and you might have an attorney or whatever that doesn't that misses something or not get an attorney when you need something in a contract and end up um, losing a lot in some transaction. Maybe you don't protect your intellectual property, something like that. Or your team might not have the right chemistry and people just don't get along, just fights. Um, I know of many different small businesses in, in my experience where two restaurant owners, for example, thought they would be able to build an empire together, but then they got into infighting and they ended up splitting into multiple restaurants and the, the, the different restaurants were not as good as the restaurant that the two put together and it never really took off. So it could be that it all looks well, but then the, the interpersonal dynamics begin to create a real problem. Once you've navigated all those risks, there's a series of phases a business goes through. Um, this uses kind of interesting terms, wonder, blunder, thunder, plunder, and then a sunder or reverse, reversion, recursion to wonder again. Um, the idea being that the startup is all excitement and you're just getting started, everything is new, and you get going as your market starts to grow. Um, you go through this period, which I mentioned before, which there's a lot of failures moving from the startup phase to a going concern. But assuming you get across that, that chasm, as you might say, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, you get into an existing business, continuing to grow, but maybe you're growing, it's growth is slowing down a little bit, and you're creating some sense of who you are and, and, and trying to cre uh, reduce your cost base and all that, creating some mythology and some history about who you are. And then you're a peak business for a while, and competitors might come in, but you're quite strong and um, you're able to sustain yourself, but eventually your products and your business might become stale and either you get competed away by others, that's the liquidation process, or potentially you renew yourself and you have this wonder phase again and you take off 
once more. So you have to be ready for all these different phases as a leader and entrepreneur. Most critical of these, at least from our perspective, is what Jeffrey Moore, writer Jeffrey Moore, calls the chasm, crossing the chasm. And that's the phase where you go from where everything is new and exciting, and you can have your hands in, into everything, to the period where competition starts coming in, and all of a sudden your customers are no longer part of the team, because they're all excited about being part of something new, but they're now looking at you, and they're expecting you in a transaction to provide them some value. Competitors come in and offer similar products and services, and now you're up against competition, and your, your customers now become people that are almost not adversarial, but they're negotiating with you for best value. And you have to decide how to continue to grow through that period where now people judge you on the value you're providing them uniquely, when others are also trying to provide them similar value versus being somebody new that people get to be part of, this new, this new business, this new startup. And that's the chasm. And what Jeffrey Moore talks about crossing the chasm is the importance of identifying, not trying to solve everybody's problem, but identify a specific problem and renew your focus on a particular niche of, a customer, of the customers you support that you solve their problem completely. Your original, the original profit product that you created might have started to, to make some, something about their life easier, but you don't solve the full problem, and you're very broad at first, perhaps. But during this crossing the chasm phase is when you want to take your product and start talking to customers about how, indeed, you can serve their complete product need. And you offer more of a complete bundled solution to their problem so that other competitors that come in don't have it, your particular niche. They may win other niches, but they don't necessarily, they don't, they don't really understand this particular niche that you're going after the way you do. So you essentially grow across the chasm by finding one set of customers that you really want to serve well and doing every, put all your energy into serving that customer niche. It's growing fast and it's profitable, but it's not everybody. You're not something to everybody before. Uh, uh, you're not something for everybody. You're more focused on one niche. When you get to that phase, you do want to realize that it is an important transition phase in organizations that's been well studied, and some of that uh, Jeffrey, those Jeffrey Moore books, Inside the Tornado, is another one that are very good to describe how you go about thinking about solving such a problem. These are the certain the kinds of problems that you face during rapid growth. All of a sudden, believe it or not, it's not like when you're starting and you want to find out whether there's an opportunity. Usually, when things are really working for you and you're firing on all cylinders, you have more opportunities than you have time and energy. So you got to choose among the really good ones to go forward. You also, by the way, have people wanting to invest in you, giving you money, so you generally have a lot more capital than you, uh, than you would expect or that you would think you would have. And so it's really easy to make mistakes and, and invest in the wrong things, um, make serious uh, investment errors, spend money that you then have to pay back later, and, and make, um, make those kind of investment errors. So you have to start to become very, uh, very disciplined and focused on what opportunities you do and still maintain a low or a high discipline in being able to invest dollars and cents when it really makes good sense to do that and not just make, invest in everything. Very easy to make that mistake uh, during this growth phase. It's also easy to misunderstand cash burn versus collection rates. And that is you get ahead of yourself and you grow too fast and you don't have the cash to support your business. Although you have the business, enough, enough revenue to support your business, the cash isn't there because of this mismatch in cash burn, hiring people versus delivering product and services. And we can look at that in this particular picture. You can see that the, um, the first, the highest chart there is the spend rate. As you're growing fast, you're hiring people, you're buying new products for inventory, you're opening your new stores and, and fitting them out. So you're spending a lot of money. And the revenue, the orders come in, you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of quarters maybe um, after you actually open a new store, invest in the fittings or whatever, invest in the people. There's a delay in when the orders come in. The, the orders and the revenue, and the actual revenue that comes in the door is delayed yet further. So it's very easy to be spending more money than you have. And if you notice, when you're growing fast, 
the difference, the absolute difference between how much money you're spending, in this case you can see in the way over at the eight quarter mark, the two year mark, you, you're, the, the difference between what you're spending and what you're collecting is quite large. This is why many companies run out of money before they are, they're bus even though their business is successful. Everything else is working, but they don't have any cash in the bank because they are unable to manage their cash flow. They're spending for the future, but the future has not yet paid off. And they end up being in trouble and sometimes having to close stores, regroup, refit, you know, that kind of thing. Um, this is the period before, as I said in the last chart, sometimes whenever you're really growing, a lot of people want to invest in you. Um, this is kind of before that, or even worse, you need this money and now you need it and people want to invest and you end up getting poor terms or bad terms, onerous terms, because you need the cash to manage that growth. And those are the kind of things that you want to look at. So the burn rate is an important factor. It's a kind of term that they use in the industry. That's how much money you're spending per month. Spending $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, $1,000,000, $1, $1, $5,000,000 a month. That's your burn rate. Or your annual burn rate, of course, is your yearly burn rate. That's different than your run rate, which is how much revenue you're getting. And, of course, your burn rate, in this case, is much higher than your run rate. Collections is your run rate. Burn rate is... The spend rate, so your burn rate is much higher than the run rate. That means even though your business, if it was to stop and you just look at it in a point, at a point in time, it might look like you should be making money. You're not because you're spending money on the future, but you're only collecting for past activities. And those both can be some, some challenges for you. Things that become more difficult and the more the focus as you grow, the business becomes, instead of being focused on envisioning the future and products and what the product is going to be and how it's going to work and all of that, it becomes more on making good decisions about what opportunities to take, day-to-day -day activities, what to do, where to get money, um, how to invest money wisely. You're not strategizing anymore, you're just day-to-day -day making decisions and at the same time, you're figuring out how to support this potential for growth and take advantage of growth. Buying new facilities, opening new space, there's surprises, supplies don't show up, there's delays in construction, all sorts of issues that might um, cause uh, crises on a day-to-day -day basis that aren't really related to the market demand for your new product or service. They're related to the whole problem of developing and managing your growth. What you end up doing is trying to figure out how you measure your business, how might you decide what makes sense for your business. You can't necessarily look at your cash flow because your cash flow is very negative. You have to find other things. Um, one measure that some capital intensive businesses use is called EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, which is um, essentially a, a measure of uh, how much money you're getting for the assets that are already in the ground. And it's not the best measure because a lot of there's a lot of things that are excluded from that. Earning interest isn't included, taxes aren't included, you know, so it's not the perfect measure, but it does allow you to have a sense of comparing two asset intensive companies with one another and getting their what their EBITDA numbers are. Another though is revenue per employee, and you want to look at different industries. So if you're in the restaurant industry, you might try to look at a, at a restaurant that's uh, like Yum Brands Restaurant. Their, their metric is $154,000 per employee. You might be paying employees $20,000 a year. So you can see you have a lot of other expenses, real estate expenses and all of that associated with it. Somewhere like Walmart has a much lower number. You can see McDonald's here has a much lower number for employee revenue per employees. Um, and hotels, likewise, $63,000 for the Sinesta uh, International Hotels. So you want to be looking at, are you getting enough revenue? Every time you hire somebody, is there enough revenue to support that? If you have a million dollars and you're in a business that's somewhere like Delta Airlines, uh, Delta is a bad example because they're so big, uh, we'll say you're like in the Home Depot uh, marketplace and you're making a million dollars, that would imply, if Home Depot is a competitor, they, you, have, you can have three people if you're making a million dollars a year. If you're making $10 million, you ought to be able to get, do that with a 
according to this metric, 30 million, 30 people. Um, so you can see that there's a, um, uh, there, there's a way to figure out whether or not you should hire or not hire, and you start to be thinking about, do I have too many people? When do I hire? Do I have enough people? And um, metrics like this is one good example of how you might be thinking along those lines. So as you grow, you start to understand that you're managing now a large operation that has many moving parts. It's not the same excitement of that beginning vision and having your vision realized. It's nuts and bolts of growing a large business with all these various different flows of cash, your run rate, your burn rate, making all of these decisions. But ultimately, you have to remember that if you identify the opportunity and you develop the business model, you think of it as a business that has to be generating profits and enough cash flow to invest back in the business and there's the timing elements and you're assembling all these resources and learn how to run the business as we described, you'll ultimately be successful. These are the things that you want to be thinking about as you move into the phase out of the startup and into the phase of growing the business. Lots of issues, no time to cover all of them here. But if you remember, it's all about the opportunity, the business that generates a profit, and having the right resources available, you'll be successful. Thanks a lot for your attention. And we will see you in some future 